hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for this uh, fairly short webinar, I think is the word. Um, Michael and I are going to talk about rectification, uh, evidence and pitfalls. Um, okay, let's uh, make a start. This is the ground we're going to cover uh, today. Um, I'm going to kick off uh, and uh, talk a little bit about um, subjective intent and uh, how that is to be assessed. Uh, really, I'm kind of the warm up act for, for Michael's uh, session, which is numbers two and three. Um, the uh, first of his bits is going to be going into a bit more detail about how to evidence um, uh, collective intention, collective subjective intention, uh, in particular in the light of uh, the judgment of Mr. Justice Trower in Univar. He's then going to talk a little bit about legal effects uh, versus consequences and how you assess the line between the two. And then I'm going to finish off with a little bit about um, the use of confidential opinions in uh, pension rectification claims. So let me uh, kick off a little bit of uh, history. Uh, and also, um, I have assumed for the purposes of these first few slides, um, a certain level of knowledge about what the test is for uh, rectification of uh, instruments, including pension scheme documentation. Um, if anyone is in uh, the least doubt about that. I know Michael, when he gets to his um, session, is going to um, is going to do, do a recap of what the test is. Uh, so don't worry. Um, a little bit of um, history, um, and I'll rattle through this fairly quickly. Uh, it was the case some years ago um, that subjective intention seemed to be the correct test. So, uh, what's the intention of the parties to the instrument you are trying to rectify? Um, it seemed that it was. Um, their subjective intention for a while, uh, at least in respect to pension uh, documentation. Um, there was also a, an issue about whether an outward expression of accord was uh, necessary. Um, and one of the cases that discussed that was uh, Munton Beasley back in 2006, Ms. Uh, Lord Justice Mummery. Uh, we then had Chartbrook, well-known uh, case, not a pensions case, but it, it dealt with, amongst other things, rectification uh, in the House of Lords. And uh, Lord Hoffman, uh, in uh, what was strictly an obiter part of the judgment, uh, said, uh, in short, uh, it is an objective test when you're dealing with common mistake. Um, the, the cases fairly consistently say it's subjective in intention where it's a unilateral mistake, but uh, he said, objective test for common mistake. That was then picked up by uh, umpteen uh, subsequent non-pension cases, um, Daventry and Woodford are two examples. It was then picked up in pension cases. Um, for example, Mr. Justice Foss's judgment in industrial acoustics, Mr. Justice Warren in IBM, and so on. So, so far, so uh, sorted, we all thought, or I did. Then we come to FSHC in the Court of Appeal um, in 2019. Lord Justice Leggett, as he then was, uh, in something of a tour de force, judgment went through uh, I think pretty much every rectification case that has ever been uh, and said uh, having done that well Lord Hoffman was wrong, Chartbrook was wrong, it was obiter so I in the Court of Appeal am not bound by it and it is in fact a subjective, a subjective test. Uh, he included in his discussion pensions cases uh, in that uh, in, in his judgment in a fairly short section but um, uh, in, in the subjective test um, uh, applied in a pensions context, although FSHC wasn't a pensions case, so again, that's strictly obiter. Uh, he held that an outward expression of accord is needed, but not in a pensions case. So that is where pensions and non-pensions cases part company. We then have uh, a number of pensions cases dealing with um, uh, rectification of pension scheme documentation after FSHC. I've given you a few here, Blatchford, Collar, uh, SPS, were all dealt with um, by way of disposal. They weren't contested. Univar, as Michael will tell you in a moment, was a contested uh, case. Uh, so we come to the question, well, what, what, what needs to be uh, established evidentially? And one might have thought, uh, and I know uh, there were discussions about this at the time. Well, if we're dealing with a subjective uh, intention, not an objective intention, well, does that mean there's going to be much more emphasis put on witness statements from uh, those who were around at the time? 
Um, generally, certainly in my experience, these uh, cases tend to be dealing with matters that, um, you know, instruments that were executed years, if not decades uh, earlier, but query whether um, uh, the subjective intention test was going to be uh, something that could be met by just putting up the witnesses who said, well, this is what I intended at the time I, um, I executed the document. Not so fast. Um, Mr. Justice Leggett, as he then was, uh, referred in his uh, judgment in FSHC to a case called Guestman, um, not a pensions case, but um, uh, uh, to do with um, alleged negligent investment advice. And um, for your note, as they say, paragraphs 15 to 23 is, is the key to this. But in a, in a nutshell, he said, human memory is fallible and malleable. Um, most people don't appreciate that it is fallible and malleable. And in fact, a lot of people think that the firmer someone's apparent recollection is of events, the more reliable it is. And he said, uh, having considered some research into this, that is far from the case. Um, he's, he also said memory of past beliefs, which is clearly going to be um, relevant when you're looking at subjective intention at the time you execute a, an instrument some years or decades earlier. He said memory of past beliefs is particularly unreliable. And he also went on to say that um, the process of litigation itself gives rise to particular problems, particular biases, for example, because um, uh, the witness might have an interest in the outcome uh, or uh, their memory uh, may well uh, have been refreshed from uh, contemporaneous documents and all of this creates problems in relying on uh, witness recollection from um, years gone by uh, and uh, a short uh, quote from his judgment the best approach he says for a judge is to place little if any reliance at all on witnesses recollections of what was said in meetings and conversations and to base factual findings on inferences drawn from the documentary evidence and known or probable facts. Um, so, uh, on the basis of that, um, uh, it, it seems the uh, courts, certainly in commercial cases, are going to be rather reluctant to rely on witness evidence of what people thought they were doing um, at the time they did it some years earlier. Um, I've also given you the references to a, a couple of other cases, which um, the first of which is Blue and Ashley, which is another judgment of Mr. Justice uh, Leggett. So unsurprisingly, he followed his his own uh, reasoning in uh, in Guestman. This was the uh, rather adventurous claim by uh, someone who said he had an oral contract worth 14 million quid, which he'd made uh, when he and Mike Ashley were a little bit pickled in the pub. Um, he didn't win. Uh, Mr. Justice Leggett again said um, evidence based on recollection from uh, years earlier is particularly problematic. There is then the case of Kogan and Martin, which is Court of Appeal. This was the one about who wrote the screenplay for Florence Foster Jenkins. Um, and the Court of Appeal gave some clarification and, and rode back a little bit from um, from Guessman, saying it's not to be taken as laying down any general principle for the assessment of evidence. Uh, and it is specifically addressed to commercial cases only. Uh, and on that basis, the Court of Appeal felt they could um, that they could go in a slightly different direction on the facts of, of that case. Finally, um, uh, and this will tee up Michael's uh, session in a minute, we have uh, Univar. It's, uh, as I've already said, it's, it's a, well, certainly these days, um, one of the very rare contested pensions rectification claims. Uh, I won't remind Michael that he was on the losing side. Um, Mr. Justice Trower, um, in, uh, it's an interesting judgment, so please read it if you uh, have uh, time and inclination. There wasn't an issue about what the test was, i.e. subjective intention. There was no mention of the Guessman case at all, interestingly, but he did stress the need for cogent evidence uh, and said that uh, his word uh, claimants will invariably rely on extrinsic evidence of intention rather than just the evidence of the decision makers. So that sort of ties in with, with Guestman. Uh, we then come to the, well, ha, ha, where does that leave us? And um, it, the current state, and, and I know Michael will say a little bit more about this in a moment, but as we know, we have a subjective test, but witness evidence alone is, um, probably never, but certainly it's unlikely ever to be enough 
especially when dealing with decisions made some years ago and where almost invariably the, the witnesses have something of an interest in, uh, in, in the outcome. Um, so uh, we are uh, in the position that contemporaneous documentary evidence of, uh, of what the subjective intention was at the time is probably always, or certainly almost always going to be needed. And what you'll be looking for, as I know Michael's going to go into a little bit more detail about, is um, uh, minutes, resolutions, correspondence, that sort of thing, which um, are likely to be available if, if you're dealing with collective decision making. Uh, and um, it seems to me, for what it's worth, that where you've got some holes in the contemporaneous documentation, you, you may be able to plug them with some witness evidence. Uh, as I've said in the slide, for example, as to usual practice for company decision making and so on. Uh, but if you haven't, uh, if you haven't got much, uh, if any, contemporaneous documents, uh, or what you have got is inconsistent with what the parties are saying their subjective intention was, then you're likely to be in real difficulty. So that is the end of my first session. Um, I will stop sharing. Michael will start. And over to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Keith. Right, again, I'm hoping that's uh, worked and no doubt Keith or Vicky will, will nod or shake their head. Um, thank you, Keith, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, Keith has introduced Univar there, and, and that was a contested rectification claim, which, as he mentioned, I appeared uh, in for the Rep Ben in 2020, just before, as I recall it, the, the first lockdown. It was before Mr Justice Trower, and uh, at the time, I think he was relatively new to pensions. And in any event, at the pre-trial review, he, he walked in and introduced himself to the parties. And his very first observation uh, was to say, well, I see that one of the issues is rectification. Uh, isn't rectification really easy to get if it's for a pension scheme? Which firstly, when you're acting for the Rep Ben and contesting the application, those are not exactly words that fill you with hope. But secondly, I think more interestingly, why did he say that? Um, the reason really is because he was almost certainly thinking about point three there on this slide, the rectification test slide. This is the high level rectification test, which will be familiar to many of you. But at the moment, we're going to take it slightly out of order and look at point three. Outward expression of accord, as Keith has mentioned, it's not necessary in a pensions case. Mr. Justice Trower was keen to understand why that was, and he deals with it a bit in his, his Univar judgment. It goes back to the nature of the decision and the nature of the power. The pensions context has been compared in day and day in the Court of Appeal to the rectification of two voluntary settlements. And that's because you're usually dealing with a trustee power to make an amendment, but subject to the consent of the employer. So it's not like the usual meeting of minds in a contractual sense. Instead, there are two unilateral decisions taking place. There's the trustee decision as to what they want to do with their power. And there's the company decision as to what it or they want to do with their power to give or refuse consent. So one can analyse it, I think, as, as two decisions in parallel, which never actually need to, to meet. So having cleared away outward expression of accord, let's circle back to point one on the, the high level rectification test common intention and did the parties have it? And this is really the, the heart of it, I think. And look a little bit at how we, we go about evidencing that. As Keith has rightly said, the Court of Appeal in FSHC came up with what certainly looked like quite a landmark change, moving us back to a subjective test from the previous uh, objective test. But what is that? Uh, I think firstly, quite a helpful way of, of looking at it is, is contained in the FSHC judgment. If you look at the judgment reasonably carefully, you will see that Lord Justice Leggett uses the phrases subjective intention and actual intention almost interchangeably. It's almost the same number of times he, he uses subjective and, and actual. So he is saying you have to identify the actual intention of the parties. What is the way to do that? Like in most cases, whether they're rectification or not, you look at the totality of the evidence, the documents and the witness evidence. But I think in particular, as all the cases show in, in pension rectification, when you're doing that, there are two factors to really keep in mind, which are of usually a particular relevance to uh, rectification of pension schemes. The first is 
you are usually in this sort of case asking witnesses to remember what happened many years ago and i think that in reality everyone would probably accept picking up what mr justice leggett was driving at in guessmin we might be able to remember events from many years ago but remembering how we felt about those events or what we thought about them at the time is extremely difficult and that's why mr justice leggett as he then was in guessmin was really saying well look how helpful is this this type of witness evidence likely to be. Secondly, though, the other big point to bear in mind is where rectification of a pension scheme is concerned, and this was Mr Justice Trow's big point, which comes through quite forcefully in the unified judgment. He was always zooming in on the fact that he was being asked to assess collective intention. So he said, shouldn't I just focus upon the documents that they all saw, they in that case being the eight or nine trustees, and shouldn't I just focus on the documents that were shared between them? So in Univar, there was quite a bit of cross-examination of the trustees as to what they thought they were doing when they executed the particular deed in question. And some of the trustees, not all, but some gave quite helpful evidence to the Rep Ben's case. But Mr Justice Trower really cleared all that to one side because he said, well, the private thoughts of the trustees about what they may or may not have been thinking isn't of much interest to me because I'm going to always be looking for that collective intent. And this is really expressed clearly in the passages in and around paragraph 209 of the judgment, which is up there on the slide. Because the court is required to identify the collective intent of a body of individuals, the manifestation of that intent will most clearly be established by the documentation with which they were provided and which they discussed, together with the documentary record of those discussions. So his point is really, you can't have a collective intention unless it is objectively manifested on paper in a form which all of the trustees read. And that collective view inevitably in this type of case is going to be either the minutes, which express their view as a whole, or the basis on which they are to be taken to have acted as expressed in board papers or legal advice and so on, which we'll come on to in more detail in a moment. But it really brings us back to saying that although you are looking at the totality of the evidence, it's most likely to be the documents that are going to make or break your rectification application. So it's the actual intention of the parties. And the other phrase which bounces around all the authorities is that cogent evidence is required or convincing proof is required, that kind of phrase, which is, is well known to everyone. But what does that look like in, in practice? I think it's not always easy to visualize exactly what it needs to look like in your case when the papers first, first hit the desk. And I'm gonna take Univar in a bit more detail now because although it had some quite quirky and quite unique facts, it was also in some ways a classic of the genre in terms of it being a case where the intention not to make a specific change needed to be inferred from the absence of any positive evidence that there was an intention to make it. So, the company was pointing to a vacuum and saying it's that vacuum which shows we didn't intend to make the change. So we're on to the next slide, slide 10. These are the facts of Univar. There was a problematic redraft of scheme rules in 2007. It was originally the exercise was supposed to be a consolidation and nothing was, was going to change. In evidence, it started to emerge that some things had changed, not just superficially, but to the benefit fabric of, of the scheme. But the fundamental change, the problematic one, was to indexation and revaluation. The old rule tracked the statutory position, which in 2007 provided for increases and revaluation by reference to RPI, and it had done that for years. So no one foresaw in 2007 that that was likely to change. The new rule that crept in hardwired in the current statutory position in terms of it hardwiring in the drafting, well, it drafted in increases by reference to RPI. People read it and understood it, but no one saw it as objectionable because they would have shrugged their shoulders and said, sure, it's, it's RPI, I know it's supposed to be RPI, and it's the same as it was. In 2007, when they executed the deed, no one foresaw or was, was focusing upon what George Osborne would do a few years later in 2010, when he changed the measure of, of revaluation and indexation and using revaluation orders uh, to a CPI basis. So uh, against those facts, 
we can start to pick out some of the evidence that is going to be needed to, to demonstrate this common intention in any case. Obviously, to some extent, it's going to depend upon the scheme's practice and the particular trustee's practice as to how they run and, and document things, their approach to minutes and so on. But I think we can make these this sort of shopping list really of, of uh, potential bits of evidence, which we now are going to be very useful. Firstly, the gold standard, I think, which won't always be present, but it's great if, if it is, is either a board paper for the board or a document from the trustees solicitors offering legal advice to them, which sets out the position on what the new deed is doing. That was the position in Univar, where the trustees solicitors provided a schedule of changes document to the trustees before a meeting that was quite close to the point of execution, although there ended up being a, a big delay. And the company was able to say that it was a document designed by the trustees legal advisors to be a comprehensive explanation of the effect of the new deed and rules. The relevant rules that, that changed were on the schedule of changes, but the rule as identified didn't spell out that the previous position, whereby increases track the statutory position, was being hardwired in at the current rate of, uh, of RPI. So the trustees didn't appreciate in substance that anything was changing. So I think if you've got that sort of document in or around uh, the time of execution, listing the changes, then the trustees will all come and they'll all say, well, I read that document. I mean, there's not, there's not a lot else they can say to that. And it also gives the court a nice document to use as the foundation point for assessing this, this all important collective intention, uh, which we, we've been discussing. So some form of board paper or schedule of changes type document prior to execution is, is a gold standard, I think. As well as obviously the minutes, which are near to the point of execution. And if they follow the modern style, they might even simply say, it was resolved to follow paper X and, and then you really are off to the races. Drafts of what becomes the new deed were very useful. One can see often where the alleged error creeps in. Just taking a couple of these on this list, slightly out of order. Post-transactional evidence is admissible in a rectification action. So for example, in the shape of AVRs or um, actuarial practice after the error has crept in, any evidence to show that the error was simply ignored in practice is going to be admissible and helpful. Policies, I've got company policies up there at point four, do look for any contemporaneous company policies or sponsoring employer policies which might bear upon the question. In Univar, there was a policy which mandated that scheme changes that may incur above a certain level of expense must be referred higher up the ladder of the parent company. And so the fact that that wasn't done was evidence that the change was not, was not intended. I think as a general observation, I'd say, I don't think it matters if a few documents are missing, for example, some letters or some attendance notes, that, that is going to happen when one is looking back over a, a long expanse of time. As long as there is a, a complete enough picture so that a judge can feel he or she has got a stable picture of what was going on, then I think that's going to make them feel that they've got more than enough. And then the, the final, perhaps gold standard piece of evidence, which I put on the list, which I'll discuss for a few minutes in a bit more detail now, is point five, evidence from, from the drafters, for example, the solicitors, if it's that type of case. So the idea obviously is for them to come and say, well, I was only instructed to draft in changes A, B and C and change D and E were definitely not ones that were drafted under instruction. This is a sort of, we'll move to the next slide, Evidence from the drafters. This is a sort of Hobson's choice, which is often presented to, for example, solicitors or any drafters, uh, which I think is ultimately fine, but does have the potential to be tricky and usually requires some quite careful thought and some quite careful handling. There is usually always a mistake in the background somewhere, of course, it's just the nature of a rectification action. And so there's often a letter before action alleging negligence and a standstill agreement sitting in the background. And then the drafter, for example, the solicitor is asked to come and give evidence in the rectification action where any loss from the negligence uh, might be mitigated or extinguished. Now, there is some logic to doing that for sure, partially in law, in terms of a well-known first instance refrain, 
of negligence is no bar to rectification. That's up there in the paragraph, or the first bullet point rather on the slide, because I think when you look closely at that proposition, you, you do start to realize it's never really been properly reasoned by a court in a pensions case. It comes originally from the judgment of Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins in AMP and Barker, 2001. And what he said at, at the very tail end of the judgment where he was re-emphasizing the decision he'd already made was the quotes there, picking it up really in the middle, middle of the second line, negligence not only does not prevent rectification, but is a ground for it. As I say, when you look at the judgment, this is the first time the concept of negligence has been introduced into the judgment at all. The judge doesn't record any submissions on the point and he doesn't provide any more reasoning than is there in that quotation. It's also slightly odd in the context of the case in that the drafter uh, in the AMP case itself was an in-house legal advisor employed by the company. And so there could ne never have been really any live question of a negligence action on the facts of AMP because the company weren't going to sue themselves. And this proposition from this first instance authority then really bounces around a lot of the first instance rectification judgments, whether they're summary judgments or uh, contested judgments, sort of echo chamber, which is also how it's dealt with in, in Univar. Just put the paragraph reference up there on the slide, 215, you see Mr. Justice Trower saying, well, as Lawrence Collins said in, in AMP. And in Univar, I should explain, the drafting solicitors came and, and gave evidence and were very frank in admitting their, their mistake. Now, of course, there's also a logic to it in a theoretical sense in that on the overriding logic of a rectification action, members are only being put back in the position they should always have been in, but for the mistake. And so the argument would be, well, why should they instead receive a windfall and the solicitors insurers pick up the bill? But on the other hand, well after AMP in, in 2013, we had in the Supreme Court, the case of Pitt and Holt, and in a different area, of the law on, on equitable mistake that the rule in Hastings Bass was cut down to size and part of that judgment. But one of the reasons for doing it was because the Supreme Court said, well, if the trustees have received professional advice, which turns out to be wrong, it's not right for them to be able to set the decision aside on the basis that they have taken into account irrelevant considerations. And one of the reasons for the Supreme Court saying that was because they said that their real remedy was against their legal advisors. And that's partly illustrated by paragraph 81, which is up there on the slide. <clears throat> Such a result cannot be achieved by the route of attributing any fault on the part of the professional advisors to the trustees as their supposed principles. So I think there is clear first instance authority that negligence is no bar to rectification. That's definitely the case, but it is worth keeping an eye on the fact that no one's ever really considered or argued it properly, I don't think. And there may even be an arguable disconnect with Pitt and Holt, albeit in a different corner of the law of mistake. But nevertheless, that observation aside, therefore, if you can get the draftsman to come and freely admit to the error in what is generally a pretty difficult session of evidence for all concerned, then that is going to be very helpful evidence indeed. Next slide. Application to exclude. I think the last point I wanted to make about evidence was, was this. It's clear from everything we've been discussing that FSHC, the move to a test for actual intention, irrespective of how it works, what it definitely does is provide some greater scope for the relevance of witness evidence at trial than a preceding purely objective test would have done. So I think it's probably an important step for all parties contesting application of rectification to take a step that we took in Univar, which is to make an application to exclude witnesses from the courtroom so they don't hear the evidence that other people are giving when they give it. Now the court has the, the power to do this under the two limbs of the CPR which are up there on the slide and the general position is, is set out and fixed on evidence which is also up there on the slide. Sometimes the judge accedes to a request that the witness remain outside court until they are to give evidence. I think there's two key points to keep in mind about this. The first is it's a much easier application to, to succeed upon. This is what the 
the case law shows, when you're not dealing with a witness who is also a party. So one needs to keep an eye on that in rectification claims because if some of the trustee witnesses are still trustees, then it's possible or likely that they will be named as defendants. And it's much easier to succeed and get them excluded from the courtroom if that's the case. Sorry, much harder. Um, but it's much easier if they're, they're mere witnesses. The second big point is that the way to go about it is, is to stress that no one is suggesting that uh, responsible trustee, former trustees or board members are going to be coming along and deliberately trying to mislead the judge. It's, it's a much more subtle application than that. It's a submission that I think, again, draws inspiration from those paragraphs of, of Mr. Justice Leggett in Guessman, which Keith is referring to, about the fallibility of human memory. You are really saying, look, judge, if people are going to be discussing a decision taken years ago, you, the judge, are going to struggle, most likely, to get an accurate recollection out of them in any event, even if they're doing their best. That struggle is going to be made all the harder by them sitting in court, listening to what all their fellow trustees or fellow board members say that they remember about the decision and what they say they thought was important about it. And there is just likely to be a colouring of evidence that goes on, even if it is subconscious. So why take that risk? Why not maximise the chances of the court getting the best evidence and exclude the witnesses from, from the courtroom? The application was opposed in Univar, but Mr Justice Trower was happy to grant it. And I think post FSHC, it really is one that should be made if you're in a position of, of opposing an application for rectification. Right, the, the second overarching issue I was going to cover was this issue of legal effect against consequences, which we see there on the next slide. It's a roadblock or a pitfall, I think we've called it in the title, um, which is often put in issue in pension rectification cases. It's the assertion that the mistake which has been made is a mistake as to the consequences of the action and not a mistake as to the legal effects of the action. Now, this is terminology which obviously many of you will be familiar with bleeds over from the cases which deal with the slightly separate issue of equitable mistake, but authority makes clear it's potentially equally applicable to rectification. And the basic proposition is that if your mistake is as to legal effect, then you're off to the races and that's just fine. But if it's a mistake as to the consequences of the transaction, you are not entitled to your remedy. It's generally always run by opponents of rectification and I think they're perfectly entitled to do so because I think the case law is pretty messy on it and not very clear. There are two cases which are clearer, I think, and they're both, they both arise out of a, a fiscal context, and they're the two that were cited in Univar where this point was run, Raycal and Allnut and Wilding. Briefly going to describe the facts of them, because I think they start to help us get a feel for which cases fall the, the wrong or the right side of the hump, depending on what you're arguing. Raycal is a case about tax consequences and about a deed of covenant. Uh, apparently, once upon a time, if you covenanted income for more than three years, you could deduct it from your total income. And for example, if you wanted to support your children as a beneficiaries because you weren't paying tax on, on that proportion of your earnings. So that was the legislation they were trying to use here, but it had to be for more than three years. And by mistake, the covenant in the Raycal case didn't exceed three years because they messed up the dates in the instrument. So the application failed, I think, for slightly complicated reasons, but those reasons really all related to the court not being satisfied that anyone had gone through the process and got very close to a position of putting in the correct dates upon which the payments should actually have been made. And it said, well, you can't just come before us and point to the fiscal outcome that you were hoping to achieve when you haven't really given us the steps along the way and the detail about what you're going to do and where you went wrong. So the application failed because there wasn't enough evidence on intention and the fact that it didn't achieve the desired fiscal outcome didn't, didn't change that. Second case, Allnut and Wilding, this was a strange claim where the applicant wanted to make, just wanted to make a potentially exempt transfer, but failed to do that probably because they set up a discretionary trust and not what they're aiming for or should have done, I gather, which is an interest in possession trust. So it was said, look, my instructions were 
to effect a potentially exempt transfer. The instrument doesn't reflect what I wanted to do, and therefore the settlement should be rectified and set aside. And obviously, um, or should be rectified rather. And they couldn't set it aside for mistake because the result of that would have been that the farms would the funds would have still formed part of the settlor's estate. The Court of Appeal in this case refused rectification there as well, and they said the, the mistake here, you're not pointing to or identifying any mistake as to the language or the terms or the meaning or the effect of the settlement. The only mistake that was made was that the payment of the £550,000, as is on the slide, that payment was supposed to be a potentially exempt transfer, and it wasn't. So I think with those two cases, you would probably be saying so far so good. If one looks at something like all that, you can see that it's pretty clearly the wrong side of the hump because there wasn't really any evidence being put before the court as to what alternative settlement they were aiming for but missed. There was just evidence that they'd missed their outcome. But I do think the distinction becomes much harder to draw as soon as you stray out of these cases which have a fiscal context and Consistent with that, it is an argument that has generally failed in the pensions context. If we look again at uh, AMP and Barker, I should say in terms of the facts of AMP and Barker that the trustees wanted to amend incapacity benefits, but didn't spot that those benefits cross-referred to the general definition of deferred benefits. So there was a cross-reference there, which meant that the incapacity improvements were given to all the deferred members by accident. We know that the, the argument was taken here because of a, another sort of by the way type remark which pops up in the judgment. It's, it is in paragraph 70, though it's not the bit on the slide. I'll just read it. Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins recording, um, and these are his words. In the present case, counsel for the representative beneficiary ultimately accepted that if there was a mistake, it was a mistake as to legal effect and not merely as to consequences. But what he then said in substance was, this is the quotation up there on the slide. If anything, it is simply a formula designed to ensure that the policy involved in equitable relief is effectuated to keep it within reasonable bounds and to ensure that it is not used simply when parties are mistaken about the commercial effects of their transactions or have second thoughts about them. That's the sort of comment I can tell you we've probably all seen that it's fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't really help you work through to its sort of knotty conclusion how it might apply to your case when you're looking at the papers early on. Just keeping half an eye on time, in Univar, the point was taken in Univar as well and was rejected by Mr Justice Trower. Part of the reason is, is contained in paragraph 225, which is up there on, on that slide. So uh, I think the general point to keep in mind as a starting position is it's an argument that does tend to fail in pensions cases. And if one conducts the thought experiment and starts thinking, well, actually, what would be a pensions case where, where it worked? Again, you're probably, you could say if you move back into the fiscal sphere and say, well, if you had a pension scheme, which you wanted to qualify as a registered pension scheme for tax purposes, but you messed it up. So it didn't qualify for the beneficial tax treatment, but it was still a pension scheme that would possibly be inside the test and might engage it. But it, it's hard to think of other examples. So how do we round this off? I think there's quite a helpful way of looking at it, which is contained in the judgment of Mrs. Justice Rose, again, she then was, uh, now in the Supreme Court. This way of looking at it probably works for fiscal and pure pensions cases. It's a case called RBC against Stubbs. And that concerned a settlement where there were successive life interests for a husband and wife, and the wife was getting divorced. And she asked for a deed of amendment, which would remove her husband's beneficial life interest. The solicitor didn't simply remove the husband's life interest, but instead completely revoked the original appointment and made a new one that had a disastrous tax consequence. Counsel in this case, one can see, was relying heavily upon all that. But Mrs. Justice Rose said this, if we look at the slide, see the first sentence, I do not agree this case falls into the same category as all that. But then in particular, if we pick it up, in the final sentence, I recognise that if there had not been adverse tax consequences, as Mr Wilson has described, the parties might not have thought it was worth coming to court to apply to rectify the deeds. But the need for rectification can be made out here without referring 
to the tax consequences as a mistake. And I think it's that last point, which is quite a useful way of looking at it. If you look, for example, at Allnut or Raycal, you can analyze it and say that the party is lost there because if you excluded the tax consequences from the equation completely, they simply hadn't met the rectification test on intention. And so I think the best way to go about it is to, to keep your eye on that ball, to focus upon whether you can succeed in your claim for rectification. Because if you have got a strong case, there aren't really cases that are out there which are being put in your way where the court is saying, well, we're terribly sorry, you would have succeeded and the test is met, but we're going to designate this as a, as a consequences case and so therefore you fail. Rather in those consequence cases, what really happened was the applicant couldn't really describe or identify with enough precision what it was they were seeking to achieve in the first place. And now I think we're back to Keith for confidential opinions. Okay, just in the last bit of this session, um, and again, we'll make sure we're done by two o'clock. Um, I'm just gonna say something about confidential opinions um, and how the courts um, presently view them, um, or, or, or that's better put as how they have viewed them in the last year or two, uh, and um, some thoughts about where it, potentially things things are going to go in, in the future. So first question, what, is, what do we mean by the confidential opinion procedure? This may be familiar to everybody. Um, I'll take it fairly quickly. Counsel for one party, possibly both parties, does um, uh, produces an opinion of, of, of the merits. Um, and the procedure involves that opinion being shared with the court, but not the other parties. And um, if, uh, if the judge wants it, um, there can be a private session uh, during which the, the judge and the relevant party can discuss uh, the contents of the opinion. By private, I mean just that party is, is present in the courtroom uh, and their representatives and, and everyone else is booted out of the hearing. Um, it's a it's a pretty uncontroversial process in some types of hearing, BEDO uh, applications and compromise hearings uh, are two that spring to mind. Um, uh, it it uh, started being used in rectification hearings, which were unopposed. They, certainly in my experience, they tended to be put as a summary judgment matter um, uh, back in the day, but more recently as, as disposal hearings under, under part eight. The earliest case of which I'm aware um, in, in which it was used, because um, I was the one who did it, is, um, is Scania and Wager from 2007. Um, and uh, again, in my experience, it was a process that was consistently used thereafter until we came to 2016, uh, what I've called a bump in the road. There were a, a number of cases um, some of which sort of overlapped in terms of when they were being argued and when judgment was being uh, issued. Um, Girls Day School Trust uh, was one of them. I'm conscious that uh, certainly one of the counsel who was in that case is, uh, is present uh, virtually at this uh, webinar. Um, it was a judgment of Mr Justice Norris, judgment given on the 26th of May 2016 there was no hearing, it was an a rectification application being done on the papers, so um, in that sense pretty unusual. Mr Justice N Norris did follow the procedure, so he did, um, even though there wasn't a hearing, um, he, he did take uh, counsel's opinion, counsel for the Rep Ben, uh, into account, but he said at paragraph 50 of his judgment, um, he it was unlikely that courts would do so in the future um, if uh, applications were being dealt with without a hearing. Um, made comments about um, uh, decisions being made in, in darkened rooms and so on. Um, so that that um, presented possibly a bump in the road, but but it was restricted to um, matters being dealt with without a hearing. We then come to Saga and Paul, his honour judge Hodge QC, he who wrote the book on rectification. Um, he uh, heard an application and gave judgment on the 28th of July 2016, so a couple of months after Girls' Day School Trust, and he disapproved of the procedure in, in fairly clear terms. He said, for example, that um, the justification that's often given is, well, Rep Ben doesn't want to show their hand, and he made the point, um, which some may think has some force, 
well, there's no issue about showing your hand because you've already done that when deciding not to oppose the rectification application. But uh, as far as I am aware, the point was not really argued. It doesn't, it doesn't seem from the judgment that it was argued. It doesn't even seem that it, that it was in fact a live issue. There was no suggestion, I don't think, that the confidential opinion procedure should in fact be followed in that case. We then come to Sovereign Trustees and Lewis, um, another 2016 case, apologies, I've lost the second square bracket. Um, Chief Master Marsh, who will feature in uh, later judgments, he heard it um, uh, a few days before Saga and Paul was argued uh, and judgment given, but his judgment was given um, uh, in October and he approved of the procedure, paragraphs 35 and following, referred to as, uh, as an established practice which operated well and he found it helpful. So um, a, a divergence of uh, views from the bench. Since then, so since 2016, there has been a whole series of um, unopposed cases. Uh, some of them I've given you the references here um, in which the procedure was followed with no uh, apparent problem. Um, most recently, earlier this year in, in CMG. Where does that leave us now? Um, you might think, well, 2016 was nothing more than a bump in the road. Um, uh, everything is fine in terms of using the confidential opinion procedure for unopposed rectification applications. There will be no further problem. But um, a number of points, as I've set out in the bullet points in these slides, the Chancery Guide, um, it, in its latest incarnation from, uh, from last month, albeit these particular paragraphs haven't been updated for a while uh, and still refer to Master Teverson as, the, as the, the assigned pensions master, even though he's retired. Um, so, so query whether it will stay like this. But, but the Chancery Guide still says that uh, with regard to confidential opinion use in rectification applications, the position is, quotes, unsettled. And it refers to cases such as Sandra and Paul. Um, CPR, um, 39.2, um, this is my, my hopefully fairly accurate paraphrasing, but um, you know, pr principle of open justice is the default and you depart from it only in exceptional circumstances. Um, the cases, certainly most if not all of the cases post 2016 that have uh, used the confidential opinion procedure without any um, problem um, were judgments of Chief Master Marsh and Master Teverson, who were um, certainly in the case of Chief Master Marsh, um, pretty keen on this process. So it seems to me what is going to happen in future must be in some doubt. Uh, where next is, is the question posed in this, um, in this final slide. We have a new uh, Chief Chancery Master Schumann, as she is called. Um, as of last week, I think it was Friday, she was um, sworn in. Um, there isn't, as far as I'm aware, a, an assigned pension master to replace um, Master Teverson in that role. And certainly, as far as I'm aware, the, the word on the street seems to be that there isn't going to be one. Um, so the, the corporate memory, as it were, of Chief Master Marsh and Master Teverson, um, you know, one is possibly starting from scratch with with whoever deals with these cases in, in future. Um, I've, I've queried here what, why any of the parties would want to prompt an argument about this, because um, if the Rep Ben uh, wants the confidential opinion procedure to be applied um, and they are saying, well, that, 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 that is one of the things I am asking for in, in return for which I will um, not oppose your rectification application, well, why would anyone want to um, want to um, uh, prompt an argument about that. Um, current practice, certainly my experience recently, has been that the parties tend to apply in advance of a disposal hearing for a direction, usually very early on in procedures, if not at the same time as issuing the claim form, um, to, to, um, uh, to get the courts um, to rubber stamp on the confidential opinion procedure being followed in the case. But even if you do that, um, it is uh, uh, conceivable, certainly, that the court could refuse it, even if um, all the parties want it. Uh, and I've referred, referred you there to the, the V and T case from, I think, 2014. It was a variation of trust case, but uh, 
um, but the court in that case, um, even though the parties w wanted um, uh, a confidential opinion procedure to be followed in that case, the court uh, said no. Um, but if the court says no, and I, I know that there are very strong views, certainly at the bar um, on both sides of this argument, uh, as to whether it is appropriate at all. Um, it, but if uh, the court refuses to allow the parties to, to follow, or, and, and indeed itself to follow the confidential opinion procedure in a, an unopposed rectification application, well, how, how will you how will you run that case? And it seems to me there's a real risk that Rep. Benz and those representing them um, may well say, well, we're just not willing to waive privilege in, in, in the advice that's been given, um, at, at which point uh, that presents potentially re real hurdles in getting uh, getting these applications through on a on a relatively cheap and speedy unopposed basis, which um, which is one of the great um, attractions for uh, for um, trustees and, and companies in these sorts of cases. So where next uh, is the question? The answer I think is I don't really know, uh, but it'll be interesting to see. Um, thank you very much uh, for joining us. As I said at the start, the recording of today will be sent out to you hopefully later this week. Um, uh, and I wish you a happy rest of the week. Uh, Thanks the sun will carry on shining. Thanks very much for joining us all. <laughs>